Welcome to Authors Night with the East Hampton Library. This event is generously sponsored by CIBC Private Wealth Management, the Hilaria and Alec Baldwin Foundation, Patty Kenner, Barbara and Stephen Hyman, Michelle Tortorelli and Tom Kearns, Janet C. Ross, Brooke Garber, and Dan Needich. We are pleased to present Howard Kopfowitz being interviewed by Bridget Leroy. At the end of this interview, there will be a Q&A, so please feel free to type your questions in at the bottom in the Q&A box. You can type them in while the discussion goes on or at the end, um, and they will be answered at the end. So thank you so much, and I hope you all enjoy. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Bridget Leroy, and I'm really excited to be talking uh, to Dr. Har Harold Koppelwitz. Sorry, you know I know how to say your name, dude. <laughs> Dr. Harold Koplowitz, and uh, I have to say, I was actually a little nervous about this. Um, I have three kids. I didn't want to get put under the microscope, or <laughs> and he also has three kids, but we've had a chance to, to break the ice before this, and uh, it really is my pleasure to, uh, to talk to him about his latest book, The Scaffold Effect. So uh, if you don't know who Dr. Harold Koplowitz is, let me, let me give you a little update. He's one of the nation's leading child and adolescent psychiatrists. Uh, he's the founding president and medical director of the Child Mind Institute in Manhattan and in San Mateo, California. Um, he's been repeatedly named as one of America's top doctors, um, New York Magazine's best doctors in New York, blah, blah, blah. He's been on all the shows like the Today Show, CBS News, Oprah, uh, gosh, on Oprah, and Anderson Cooper 360, uh, regularly quoted in all the major publications and lives in New York City. And welcome, Harold. Thank you so much for taking the time for this conversation. So I, first of all, I want to tell you, I love the East Hampton Library. I, I also, my wife and I also live in East Hampton, and we think it's a terrific library and a remarkable resource for our community. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm so glad this is being taped by the library because I had a lot of people reach out who couldn't make it tonight, but really, really want to catch up. And, uh, and, I, and I was, um, before we had our last conversation where we had lots of laughs and dropped a lot of F-bombs, uh, which we won't do tonight. Um, but somebody wrote to me and said, oh my God, you're interviewing Harold Koplowitz. He's a genius. So I just wanted to put that out there. So let, let's talk a little bit about Scaffold Effect. There will be time for Q&A at the end for anybody who's uh, who wants to ask a question. But has this always been your your mode, modus operandi, or have you changed over the years? Because you've been in this business for a very long time. So I would tell you that um, I think it's very hard for most parents not to feel protective about their kids and to worry about their children. and to sometimes feel guilty about their kids. So in 1996, I wrote a book called It's Nobody's Fault, New Hope and Help for Typical Children and Their Families. And I actually got letters from colleagues saying, what do you mean it's not a parent's fault? You know, maybe not, you know, uh, schizophrenia, maybe not autism, but certainly depression is a mom's fault. And I, I wrote back to someone and said, you gotta be kidding. You know, your mother might be depressing, but she doesn't give you depression, right? And so I think that, all along for decades, I've come across parents who are very worried about what will happen to their child when they're not there, when they're no longer able to help them, to move them, to guide them. And uh, certainly in the past 11 years at the Child Mind Institute, that's a theme that we keep hearing from parents. And so the idea that you can't, you can't helicopter, you can't concierge, and it's so easy to say, do this, do that, I know the answers and that a scaffold is really the way to go. That, you know, you can provide pillars, you can provide support and structure and encouragement, and you have planks and your patience and awareness, and certainly dispassionate times and monitoring, but you can't build the building. The, your, right. your child comes with DNA that's going to either become a skyscraper, a bungalow, a, a quirky Victorian a banana stand. century. A banana right, but, stand. <laughs> right, but, but they're going to live in that house. Right. And, um, and if you want your child to be independent, if you want your child to be okay when you're no longer around, whether it's that they're in college or you're gone, um, you have to just scaffold. You can't constantly hover because that message that you're going to give the kid is that you are not resilient. You are not competent. Right. You, you need me to make sure that everything's okay. And I think that that's a hard part for parents as a, as a parent. And you'll find me all over the book. Do you mean, and unlike most parenting books, which I feel someone's always shaking their finger at me, um, 
I'm very honest about the fact that you can screw up, that you can right. make mistakes and you have a chance to redraw the blueprint. And, you know, one of the few sports in the world where redos are possible is parenting. You are <laughs> able to say, I'm sorry, uh, I made a mistake that was too harsh or that was too lenient or there needs to be a consequence. And let's try that again. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think a lot of, um, as kids get older, um, like I don't really like kids very much and I have three of them, um, but they're all grown, although I have one that still lives at home. But I think a lot of it comes from that feeling that of the shaking the finger and then you, you're uh, you're assuaged with guilt. So you, you know, you act like Mrs. Cartman from South Park, like you want more cheesy poofs, honey? And then I'm like, God, that's not me. Like, why am I, you know, so I think parents that this book about scaffold effect is really about the art of parent parenting or the sport of parenting, as you said, you know, and you don't pull any punches in it. Um, I love this, and this is a perfect example of what I have done. Parents, uh, you say in the book, parents often say, I would never dump my feelings on my child without realizing the subtle ways they do it all the time. Say a child does badly on a test and you say, swear to me, you'll do better next time. Now, a parent might say that, now I'm not reading the book anymore, we all say things like that. We say the, the the smallest like things that we don't really think about because maybe we're driving or we're thinking about work and the kid didn't do well on it. So we say something that we think isn't going to hurt and it can actually traumatize a child. So how does a parent, because um, of course you're asking the kid to lie if you say swear to me about anything that there is out of their right. control. So what would be a better uh, way of encouraging your child without you know, when you're when you are actually disappointed. Sure. So let's think about it. your kid is not going to always do well on an exam. And that's a moment where there's a learning experience. You know, failure is an option. In fact, failure really helps us succeed the next time around. You, you can't always win the race. You can't always be prepared. You can't, you know, sometimes life's unfair. They give you questions you don't know the answers to. Right. And I think that that's the opportunity for you and your child to have a discussion. You mean, um, do you do you think, you know, there's something you could have done that would have gotten a better outcome? You know, is there something I could do to help? Would you like me to practice the spelling words with you uh, next week on Thursday to see if that would make it easier for you? Um, but brainstorming is really very different than fixing. Right. And, and certainly asking kids to promise to do things that they can't do is a setup for failure because you can promise all you want and it's just not going to, it's not going to come out the right way where what you really want them to do is to accept the fact that it, they were disappointed also. I'm sure that, right. you know, most kids want to please their parents. They want to please their teachers. They, they want to get good grades. Um, I love when parents say to me, oh, my kid is spoiled. I mean, really? Fish, cheese, those things can get spoiled. Children don't really get spoiled. If, if you really feel that they've lost their motivation or they, they don't seem to be trying hard enough. Or what if they have like a sense of entitlement, which goes right, well, Right, well, then why did that happen? Or why is it occurring? And, and what can we do to step back and to see, you know, how we can find an alternative way? Certainly entitlement. I mean, I think it's very easy for two things to happen when we live in such an affluent world. Uh, one is that we can take away joy from our kids. Uh, I, I have this remembrance of um, it snowed once, right? Uh, there was a blizzard on my birthday, you know, 20 years ago, and there was a hot restaurant that you couldn't get into. So my wife called up and we got a reservation in this restaurant. And when we got there, you know, we got a table and we were with another couple. And lo and behold, there was a five-year-old having his birthday at that <laughs> restaurant. And I kept thinking, so great. oh my God, if this is what you're doing at five, what's going to happen at six? Do you mean, so you can, you really can forget developmentally what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. There's a reason why McDonald's is so attractive to five-year-olds. The meals are quick. They give you a little prize. You know, you don't have to sit for a very long time. Going right. to a fancy French restaurant when you're five is most probably a mistake. But so I think one, the kids just think that everything is coming to them. And the second thing is that this bubble effect, I think that everything, everyone is super successful. I, you know, Bridget, I was talking to you about uh, an event that occurred to me that's not in the book, but many, many summers ago, about 30 some, around 30 years ago or more, I was with a friend as a summer bachelor in Manhattan while my wife and his wife and the kids were all in the Hamptons. 
and we were at some glorified pizza place. And he said to me, you know, so-and-so, he's a total wuss. And I said, why do you say that? He said, well, he's worked for Solomon Brothers or Lehman Brothers for 10 years. Why would anyone do that? And I said, well, he must have, he makes a lot of money. And he actually said to me, Harold, at best, he makes $400,000 a year. And <laughs> I'm thinking, first of all, that, mind you, this is 32 years ago. And I'm the youngest chief of child psychiatry in the country at the time. And right. maybe I'm just making $100,000. But I figured I'm not going to let him know that I don't, you know, that I think that $400,000 is a lot or a little. And he says, and you know, so-and-so, he works at Drexel Burnham. He could barely put a sentence together. He makes a million dollars a year. And you know, so-and-so, he makes $2 million a year. And I just started sitting there thinking to myself, oh my God, I missed the day at school where they taught you how to make a million dollars or someone ripped the pages out of the book. <laughs> and then the worst thought was, oh my God, everyone I know must make a million dollars a year. And the worst thing is, do they all know that I don't make a million dollars a year? And this guy actually had the nerve to say, Harold, you can't compare yourself. I, I thought I was being so neutral, but obviously I had shock on my face. And he said, Harold, you can't compare yourself to these people. After all, you're just a physician. I go, just a physician. Does he know how hard it was to get into medical school, to get out of medical school? And so he, first and foremost, I have to tell you, I didn't pay the check. I thought that <laughs> check could sit on that table and grow mold before I would pick up that check. And so he picked up the tab and I'm walking home. It's Madison Avenue between 91st and 90th. And now I'm on 90th Street and walking up the block is Paul Newman and Joanne, Joanna, uh, Joanne Woodward. And- yeah. They really like each other. He's shorter than you would think. He has bluer eyes. He's got a seersucker suit on. He actually, you could see he has some hair transplant, little plugs. He, <laughs> she's, got, she's very juicy. He's got her arm around her. And I'm too cool to say hello to them. And so I'm walking and they say to me, hi, how are you? It's so good to see you. And I said, well, it's wonderful seeing you. And he said, aren't we lucky we live in Manhattan? What a beautiful night it is. And I said, yes, it's a beautiful night well, we really should appreciate it. I said, I certainly am appreciating it. And they said, well, it's good to see you. Hope to see you soon. I said, yes. And I walk, I keep walking down to 90th Street. And uh, <laughs> instead of thinking the two of the most famous movie stars in the world at that moment, think right. they know me, all I could think about was that each one of them was making more than a million dollars a year. <laughs> so if I could be thrown off by the fact of what is my value, I love being a child psychiatrist. I'm a success as a child psychiatrist, but all of a sudden I'm comparing myself to Paul Newman and to every other fool at Drexel Burnham who's making a million dollars a year and feeling inadequate. I think it's a tough place when you live in an affluent environment, whether it's Aspen, East Hampton, New York, Chicago, LA, that it's very easy to minimize your children's success. If everyone has an Oscar or a billion dollars or the Pulitzer or the Nobel, or that you know someone who does, it becomes very hard when a child's effort isn't um, praised, isn't celebrated. It's not the product. And I talk about this a lot in the book, but it's the effort. So a, a hard earned C plus in algebra, where you had a tutor and you worked really hard, that deserves more of a celebration than an easy A in history or in English, because effort is what's going to make you successful in life. People who work hard and, and, and it's our job as parents to, to make sure that that bubble we live in doesn't contaminate our child because we protect our child by saying this deserves a celebration. Well, you and I had talked about this before, and I know this is a really big part of, of your, um, you know, your, your moral compass is that it used to be, I think, that first of all, people had their kids younger. So the kids actually saw their parents struggling on the way up. Now, people wait until they're settled, settled, because right. it's never really a right time to have a baby, but they wait until they're settled and that they have a house and they, they are making a good living and then they have a kid. So well, as the kid is growing up, they're not really seeing, I mean, they may see, of course, struggles with their parents or they might have many traumatic events if their parents are you know, uh, addicted to something or, or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but they don't see their parents struggling up the ladder of success as much as kids growing up before did. So to them, it, they're like, well, why is everything so easy? So when right. they struggle, they feel like a, a, you know, a square peg in a round hole or the opposite. And I think, so I think it's really important. You know, yeah. we talk about- but That goes to you you're discussing effort. If right. they don't and feel so, effort, how can they I, emulate? I think parents should, really make moments for discussion. So it's very lucky if you live in the suburbs, 
your kids are trapped in the car with you as you carpool or as you're driving them somewhere. You know, there's there's this moment where you can speak to them. You're looking in the front, watching the road. They're not, you know, they can talk to you without looking at your face. You know, that's, but I think parents need to find moments like that. So I think Sunday or Fridays are good times when the, in the weekend has started, the weekend's ending, to have a meal and, and to go around the table and say, why are we lucky? Why are we happy going around to it? And if you weren't lucky or if you weren't happy, if a deal slipped away from you, if you worked really hard on something and it didn't equal success uh, or someone got ill and you're really worried about them, being able to show your child that you that everything doesn't come easy, that there are bumps in the road, that we will be resilient. We will make it through that bump. But if you don't do that, everything does seem too simple. You know, everything, you know, dad just goes off and mom goes off and, you know, whether it's the Tony, the Oscar or a million dollars, it it just seems too easy. Instead of being able to talk about the fact that all of us face struggles every day and we brainstorm and we reassess and we manage to find another way to get to the end product that we want. But it's hard work. It's not all an easy road. Well, it's funny because what you're kind of talking about is letting, you know, your children see your own humanity. And it's amazing to me. I mean, my kids are older and believe me, they saw warts and all all the time, maybe too much. But it's amazing to me. I have many friends who have kids that are like eight to 11 years old and I'll know something about them and I'll be like, oh, my God, you know, so what do your kids think of that? And they're, oh, I would never tell my children about that part of my life. And I'm like, why? Like, you know, so so how do you. Um, how do you kind of put those two things together with, with a parent? If a parent comes to you and they really are trying to make themselves appear a certain way in front of their kids, how do you reckon being honest, I guess? Right. You're so I, clearly, you have to think about the age of the child, what's developmentally appropriate. You know, the, I don't know if you remember that, you know, uh, Clinton, when the Clinton Lewinsky uh, fiasco occurred, you know, um, I was asked to go on the Today Show and talk about, you know, how to talk to kids about this. And the, the number one thing I remember saying was, just listen carefully to the question. Please listen carefully to the question and answer the question in developmentally appropriate information. Don't give more information than you need to. Um, and I told the story that one of my colleagues called me and said that that morning her child said, I want to discuss what's going on in the White House <laughs> when I come home. And the child was seven years old and they wow. called me and I gave the same advice. Listen carefully to the question. It's not maybe necessary. And when the child came home for dinner at night, she said, I'd like to understand why are interns in the White House? Aren't they supposed to be in the hospital? And so here the parents were all ready to talk about intimacy and things that, so I think that clearly we have to remember where the kid is coming from what's appropriate, what isn't appropriate. But I think one of the most important messages is the idea that you have to be scaffold yourself. You have to be secure. You have to have support. You have to have encouragement. And this book was written uh, right before COVID. And um, the idea that a scaffold, if a scaffold is, is shaky, the whole building comes down when there's a catastrophic event like COVID. So if parents aren't eating something green, if parents aren't sleeping at least seven hours, if parents aren't doing something spiritual, if parents aren't exercising, they're not taking care of themselves. And if you don't take care of yourself, you're not capable of taking care of your kids. Right. And self-care is really childcare. And I have to tell you, most people throw self-care out. A, a friend of mine just wrote to me that uh, he takes exceptionally good care of himself. And I I thought to myself, really, you know, you're proud of the fact that you're taking exceptionally good care. And I thought he's right. You yeah. should take very, he re exercises rigorously every day and he's still a school teacher. And he, if he doesn't do that, he doesn't have the energy or the mindset to be a good teacher. And I think we always say, oh, well, I have to take care of my kid first, or I have to take care of my spouse, or I have to take care of the business. And we forget that self-care truly is, is childcare. You know, every time we go on an airplane, and right. we'll soon go back. A lot of us will go on the airplanes. And the metaphor of when the pressure in the in the right. um, plane drops, the mask comes down. Put the mask on yourself first before you put it on your child. Because right. if you're not breathing properly, you don't have the energy to put it on child number one or two or three. So. Right, right. And uh, you know, going to this um, 
topic about anxiety and COVID, uh, it, you do have in your book, The Scaffold Effect, which is your latest tome. Uh, you have in one section, you say you might have heard or read about the epidemic of anxiety among the younger generations. Generation Z, born between 1996 and 2012, has been called the loneliest and the most stressed generation and the most likely to report being in poor mental health. Why? Kids today are under a lot of pressure and that is a cause of the high rates of anxiety we're seeing now. They act irritable because they have a ton of work or social problems. Since teens can't yell at their teachers and friends, the easiest solution is to take things out on their parents. Whatever they're upset about, you might become the target of their anger, frustration, and fear. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is a wonderful- uh... but, but just think about it. that was before COVID. Yeah. So the way we have to think about COVID is that it is a toxic event that has an effect on everyone's mental health. So let, let, let's just think about kids for a second. 60% of the children out there are the most resilient, happy-go-lucky kids. It's just amazing, terrible things happen to them. They still bounce. It's kind of like they have a veneer on them. You know, it's amazing how healthy they are. That's 60%. But even that 60% could be concerned about the fact that I'm doing distance learning now. You know what I mean? That this has been a very tough year for me or that I was worried about my grandmother's health or my father's finances. So real life things can make us feel stressed. We then go to 15% of the population that have subclinical symptoms. So in other words, they're a little more irritable, they're a little more anxious, a little more inattentive, a little more sad, but they never have enough symptoms that causes enough distress or dysfunction to ever get to a mental health professional because they function pretty well. Well, if you put them under more stress, these subclinical kids become more symptomatic. Now we have 20% of the population that does have a mental health disorder, but unfortunately only 40% of them actually get help. So you have 60% of kids who are symptomatic before COVID hits and now COVID makes them more symptomatic. And then we have 5% of the population that have very severe psychiatric illness where they lose touch with reality or they're so developmentally behind that they're out of it either intellectually or emotionally and so typically COVID like events wouldn't affect them. World War II, you know, the, the Great Depression, but COVID did affect them because the supply chain got affected. So their meds didn't show up in the pharmacy or their day programs got eliminated. So we have an event that went on by the way, for more than a year, putting a tremendous amount of pressure on kids. And so they clearly are gonna be more irritable. They are going to be more, and many of them are gonna have trouble going back to school in September. They got comfortable in front of the screen. They got comfortable hanging out near mom and dad. And so we know that a good 15% of the children next year are going to struggle with this. And in fact, the Trauma Institute got a $25 million grant from the state of California to produce educational materials and film for every student, every parent, and every teacher in Spanish and in English to help them with re-entry. And that re-entry is not gonna just be Labor Day. Re-entry is going to go on in October and November. And so if we know that everyone had a learning loss, this was definitely a bad year academically, we know that they can make up for it. Kids whose brains are younger than 24 years of age, they are uh, very, very resilient and they can make it up. But if you're not in class and you're not physically and mentally present and you're calm and you're not inattentive, it's gonna be very, very difficult. So the idea of these kind of tools that we're producing are not only for the kids, but it's for the teachers also because they need a new tool set because business as usual, unfortunately, isn't going to happen. And as we see now with the variants, that COVID is not disappearing. It, it's going to be something that our young friend, uh, you know, our, our, our younger generation is gonna to have to live with for several years. Um, and we're gonna just have to modify a new normal. And that means again, better scaffolding better parenting. I'm sorry, because I know most parents are exhausted, but again, support and structure and encouragement, not only for yourself, but for your kids too. Trying to, to find, catch your kid, I say this all the time, catch your kid being good. I mean, it's so, it's so easy when we, you know, we monitor uh, bad behavior. You know, if we, it's confirmation bias. If we think our kid is hyper or if we think our kid is lazy, we will capture the kid doing what we believe they're doing. It's kind of like why some people watch Fox and some people watch CNN, some people watch MSNBC. They wanna believe what they believe is right. right. And so if you have confirmation bias, you're catching your kid being bad. And what I would suggest is monitor all behavior. 
see if you could capture them in good. And when they really are good, when they just helped you set the table, it doesn't make a difference if you ask them several times, then definitely confirm okay. it for them by saying, thank you so much. You did such a good job. It really makes me feel good that you were able to do to be so helpful to me by setting the table. And so labeled praise. The amazing part about this is that if you label praise, if you actively ignore insignificant off-task behavior, and you only intervene when your kid does something really egregious, lying, hitting, throwing, cursing, stuff that's really egregious, you will change that kid's behavior. Now, the amazing part is that your kid is gonna think that a body snatcher took their parent or their mother, because where'd that critical woman go? But all of a sudden, after two weeks, you will get more and more positive behavior because kids wanna be praised, kids wanna be good. Um, and you can change that dynamic, but it takes a good two weeks of focusing and monitoring all behavior, not just the negative behavior, which confirms for you that your kid is lazy or your kid is dumb or your kid is, you know, uh, a bad child instead of a good child. So you've been talking about as well uh, when you were talking about matching your what we call matching your internals to other people's externals. Everybody else is making more money than you and kids, obviously. Um, there's been you know so much stuff a plethora of articles and and tv shows and and sound bites about how social media affects kids what i want to know is how social media affects parents because you know people will compare themselves constantly to the parent who's doing everything right you know without realizing what that person might be going through inside like i always say like a swan you know is always gliding on on the water but underneath the feet are doing this so what is your recommendation to parents who kind of hold themselves to a higher fantasy standard of what parenting really is? Yeah, so I, you know, look, I, I, my rule of thumb with social media was that we should keep it very limited to kids, watch how many minutes, how many hours, how much time they're using, and then COVID comes. And our kids started using a tremendous amount of screen time, uh, not only for school, but for socializing. We actually did a study on that looking at problematic internet use. And you have to understand that we had a big study going on before COVID called the Healthy Brain Network. So we had already examined 5,000 kids, giving them free evaluations, free neuropsych testing, neuro, you know, so neuropsych plus M, uh, functional MRI, EEGs, nutritional status, cardiovascular stress tests. I mean, the most amazing collection that has ever occurred on the brains of kids between the ages of five and 21. And the only thing you needed to get into the study was a parent who was worried about you. So 11% of the kids don't have a psychiatric disorder, they have symptoms, but 62% of the kids had more than two disorders at the same time. So we knew who these kids are before COVID. And then all of a sudden they start using a tremendous amount of internet usage. And we find that kids who used uh, on screen time more than six to eight hours a day and got irritable whenever you took it away from them, like taking away a drug, um, you found that that was problematic. But what was more problematic is if they had ADHD before this, or they had depression before this, their symptoms got worse. It was almost like uh, drinking booze or smoking pot, making anxious kids worse. So it turns out that if you were anxious, which I thought would definitely put you at more risk of watching the FOMO kind of stuff, you know, that you were seeing the beautiful world out there. That didn't seem to affect it, but ADHD or depression was made significantly worse by watching or spending more than six to eight hours of screen time. That means it's now time for a detox. Parents have to recognize it's time to start easy stuff. Let's have a Sunday without any screens. Not easy, but we're all going to do it. It's not just the kids, it means that we are gonna to have to live without that little ping of that email that got returned or the world won't end if from right. eight o'clock till eight o'clock on Sunday, you just have the worst reception. You turn your, your cell phone off or your iPhone off. And, and parents, have to, parents have to be the example. We for have that. to do that. We have to, yeah. it's kind of like start small, start with dinner. Everyone puts their phone in the basket and the basket gets put in the closet. And for 20 minutes, 30 minutes or 40 minutes, whatever your dinner is, that's, that's what you start. But kids are gonna have to be weaned off of this because they, are, they have gotten a really heavy, it's like a drug that they've gotten so much of it, it's gonna take time to get 
them off of it. And if they don't, you're going to find that it's very hard to have conversations with your kids because they they much rather look at the screen and get some immediate feedback. And it's also easier than socializing. Socializing requires picking up nuance and picking up, you know, the subtleties. You know, I unfortunately I I, I used my own children as examples <laughs> in the book. And you know, your kids come out. Yeah, my, my kids are very fortunate. They all look like my wife. They all look like each other. They're very attractive young men. And uh, and yet one of my sons, when he was seven years old, um, we were driving around the Hamptons. As a matter of fact, we lived at the time in Sag Harbor. And when we got to the house, we were listening to the radio. My son said, keep the radio on. I want to hear the end of the show. And it was a program on NPR. And they were talking about social anxiety. And once the show was over, my son, Josh, actually said, you don't really understand what they were talking about. But trust me, mom and I have to think about what we're going to say to people before we say it. And you and Adam just talk to people. And so he already had the insight that socially he was more reticent. He definitely was more pathologically self-conscious. And so by him telling me this, we actually worked on, you know, how you shake hands, how you say you quit, you know, when you sit down with someone, ask three you questions because everyone likes to talk about themselves. Where do you go to school? Where did you buy that beautiful shirt? You know, what do you like to do? And it wasn't natural for him. The third, our third son could run for mayor, right? So right. there's a scene in the book where we're in Central Park at a fundraiser and, um, We've practiced a lot of times. And Henry Stern was the commissioner of parks back then, a really quirky, odd guy. And he walks yeah, we, in. And he, we had a little we had a little place in Central Park, my family. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, it's oh, a little well. place, right. Yeah, a, a, little. a little tavern, right? So yeah. <laughs> so Henry comes in where we weren't a tavern on the green. We were actually at the boathouse, which right, is the where they had this benefit for us, you know, the park conservancy. And Henry comes in, he sees me and he says, oh, you're a child psychiatrist. My wife's a pediatrician. I hear you know, you're terrific. I want to meet your kids. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's really great. So he goes over to say hello to Josh, who's in second grade. And um, I introduced Josh to him and said, this is Commissioner Stern. And Joshua shakes his hand. Good shake. You know, I said, check. And I say, uh, Mr. Stern is the Commissioner of Parks. And Joshua says, what do you do with a job like that? Okay, mm -hmm. that's a you question. Check. And he says, well, I'm the commissioner, so I make sure that the grass is green in the parks and there's water in the ponds and the horses are fed. And Joshua can't tell that he's joking. And so he says, Joshua says to him, oh, that's great. How do you get a job like that? <laughs> and Henry says, well, where do you go to school? And Joshua says, I go to the Dolan School. And he said, well, tomorrow when you go to school, look around your classroom and figure out which one of your classmates is going to be mayor someday and be friends with him because that's how you get the job. It went straight <laughs> over Joshua's head. And so Joshua shakes hands with him. But when it's time to shake hands, he gets so close to Henry's face that it looks like he's either going to do an eye exam or kiss Henry. I'm not sure which. And Henry walks away and Joshua says to his mother and me, his eyes are brown. Now, <laughs> Clearly, we were working very hard scaffolding and we needed a little adjustment there. My wife whispered in my ear, I think he needs a little more rehearsal. But the fact is that he knew, he already told us that he gets uncomfortable. And so it was our job to give him some tools that didn't naturally come to him. And right. what I think about is that great scene in that movie called Parenthood, where- I love that movie. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on one sec, because I want to let people know that they can put their questions in the bottom because we're going to wrap up in about 10 minutes. If you uh, scroll, you can see the Q&A. Type your questions in there with Dr. Koppelwitz is at your service. So so go ahead. Talk about my favorite movie. Parent. So so in the movie, I don't know if you remember, they have a very quirky kid and yeah. there's a baseball game. And by like magic, the kid's glove comes up and the ball goes into his glove Heaven. and he says and then Steve Martin is so happy the game is won and he does the victory dance and he's walking away and Mary Stern, uh, Steinberger, Dean Bergen, I think, Dean Bergen is the mom and she's very calm and she says, you know, nothing really changed. All that changed was you were in the backyard with him and you threw the ball at him 1000 times. So statistically, it was a greater chance of the ball going into the glove. And I thought to myself, that's great parenting. You see a deficit and you try to minimize it. You, if the kid's a klutzy kid, you practice with him. Or if you see an asset, 
kid has a musical ear, you get piano lessons. And so you, you help the kid accentuate his assets and try to minimize his deficits. Um, now, that still requires the kid to be part of this, right? You can't force the kid to do it. But also, it's not magic. If a child is really klutzy, he might catch the ball sometimes, but we're not going to expect him to become a major league baseball player. And the same thing goes, so we're doing this to help our children to provide the scaffolding and then let them deal with it as well or as little as they want to deal with it. And I think that's that's the important part here that you know, just in the same way that you celebrated his effort of catching the ball a thousand times, it's not that he's becoming a victory baseball player after this. Right, you know right. I mean? Right. That's great. I love that there's another scene in that movie, which we quote all the time, which is, you know, where everything is going great. And then I think they're at a restaurant, maybe after one of the baseball games and he loses his retainer, same kid. Right. And then he, and he, he just, you know, he, oh, he just, it's a catastrophe. I would and say that, we, that me and my husband probably quote that once a week. We're like, I just want to go home. Can I please just go home? <laughs> because that's what he did. I just want to go home. I think I may have said that after a Hamptons event this weekend. <laughs> and we always quote that. To um, my, to my favorite scene in a movie, yeah. uh, and my kids know about this, is that Cher in Moonstruck um, sleeps with Nicolas Cage. And, you know, she. this is her future husband's brother. And after they have slept with each other, he says, I love you. I want to marry you. And she smacks him in the face and says, snap out of it. Snap out of and, it, right. And I thought to myself, how many times do you sit with your, when your kids have done something absolutely crazy? And I would say, come here. You got to snap. And my kids would put their hands up on their feet. Don't hit me, dad. I'll snap out of it. I promise I'll snap out of it. But there are <laughs> moments where we just behave. You know, we, we get caught up in the moment and we're not logical. and We're not responsible. And that's when, again, parents... Don't smack the kid in the head, but just say, come on, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to get back to reality? Right. And once again, we are talking to Dr. Koplowitz about his book, The Scaffold Effect. It's his latest book, uh, Raising Resilient, Self-Reliant, and Secure Kids in an Age of Anxiety. And um, I also wanted to talk about one of your other books, uh, More Than Moody. Because I think that one of the things, because you said, like, a, you, you know, you might say something kind of offhand to, to one of your kids without realizing the kind of traumatic effect it might have on them. Um, I myself have had a situation with my uh, one of my kids where apparently at some point, probably when I had a million other things on my mind and they were like 10 to 12 years old, those really formative years when all the hormones are coming up, apparently said to me that they heard voices in their head. And I apparently said, although I don't remember this, don't ever tell anyone else that they're gonna put you away. And I know, and I Strange, know, right. but it may, I mean, I don't know the context, right. but apparently even today, or especially today, we are now discussing that moment as being a traumatic turning point in one of my kids' lives. Um, so the more than moody thing is, is really amazing for any parents who have teenagers because, um, you know, we all had went through an emo phase. I'm sure you did too. We all did, you know, I was the leather and lace and, you know, staying out of the clubs and everything like that, whatever generation you're from. And there, I told my kids a long time ago, I was like, you know, you don't have to pretend ever that you have any kind of issue because you're plenty interesting just the way you are. Right. And uh, I am the mother, by the way, of a trans son, um, and I'm very proud of it, but he wasn't doing it to get attention. He right. is really a trans person. So I guess- but what let's I'm just, let's just stop. Let's just that? remember that adolescence is very different than childhood or adulthood. Your brain is really very different. And, and there's a reason why Hertz won't let you rent a car until you're 25 years old. It's, it's a business decision. Just think, they could be renting the car from the time you're 18, and for seven years, they won't let you rent the car. So Hertz doesn't have any neuroscientists working for them, but I can tell you that they're more impulsive, that teenagers are freezing, they're boiling, they hate you, they love you. And when you minimize that and you say, oh, it's not so bad, you know, uh, my, my mother's technique for depression is you know, when I would complain to her about the, I had a terrible day at work, she would do two things. Either she would tell me the Holocaust was over and there's nothing to be upset about and or knock your head against the wall. And when you're finished knocking your head, you'll know happiness. Neither one of those really works. And so when you, I think one has to listen very carefully to our teenagers. And since depression, it really has its onset at 13, 
and it's, so it's a teenage disease, we, we can't minimize it. And you have to remember that when teenagers get depressed, it's very different than adults. When adults get depressed, we lose our appetite, we can't sleep, we look sad, um, we, we're not interested in sex, we just look like a bump on the log. When teenagers get depressed, they're more irritable, they're incredibly rejection sensitive. If you look at them the wrong way, they really feel pain. They can be suicidal, and then 10 minutes later, they're not suicidal. So parents don't take it as seriously. They oversleep, they overeat. It's, it looks different. And so one should recognize that the most common illnesses of childhood and adolescence are mental health disorders. 17 million kids in the United States have one of these disorders. And so that means that one out of five, which means if it's not your kid, then it's your niece or nephew. And if it's not your niece or nephew, it's your best friend's child or it's your son's best friend. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, we, America hasn't wrapped their head around this and recognize these are real, common, but most importantly, they're treatable. We have psychosocial interventions that really work, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or parent management training or dialectical behavioral therapy that work in 10, 12, 16 sessions. It's not rent a friend. And we have medicines, psychopharmacology, that is really quite effective. You know, the SSRIs, which came out in the 1980s, like Prozac and Zoloft, used properly for the right diagnosis really works. And I should let you know that at the Child Mind Institute, we don't take money from the pharmaceutical industry. We don't take money from guns, tobacco, or liquor. And we don't let pharmaceutical representatives on the grounds, either in San Mateo or New York, because inevitably they're bright, they're glib, they're attractive, sure. and they but come no. with food. They come with food and they come with so i'd rather buy everyone pizza myself and buy the pens and the post-its without letting pharma in but when your child does need medicine you should make sure that it's the right medicine for the right diagnosis because these things really work when done properly diagnosis if you have the right diagnosis you can come up with a, a very good treatment program that can change a child's life can well, truly about, change the whole trajectory uh, i find that you know let's say like out here in the hamptons it's very hard to find child psychiatrists i mean if you actually live out here full time um i think there's a handful of them uh you know on the eastern end of long island and they're booked out you know months and months Correct. And what would you suggest to a parent who just has a gut feeling um that their kid is depressed or anxious and wants and thinks that medication would be helpful or their kid has a d so, so bridget the only silver lining of COVID has become telemental health. So the fact that at the Child Mind Institute, we were seeing 200 kids a day before COVID in person, and now we see 310 kids a day on a screen and 40 in person. So we're seeing kids from all over the place um, where 100 miles is too far to go from East Hampton to New York or 120 miles from Montauk or even 60 miles from you know, from uh, Southampton, it's too, on a regular basis. And yet you can do excellent work, which I didn't believe. I should let you know, full transparency, I was opposed to telehealth two years ago. I would have said, no, nonsense. We are showing that it works as well as in person if you can get the diagnosis. You know, it's really important that it's not just supportive psychotherapy. You have to have a diagnosis and then decide. And I think if you are worried about your kid, um, the Scaffold Effect's a wonderful book, but it's yeah. not about psychiatric illness. You should go to the child, to childmind.org, our website, which has had 58 million visitors. Uh, it gets one and a half million unique visitors every single month. And go and check our symptom checker and fill out for 20 minutes a symptom checker on your child. And if you see that there is something to worry about, pick up the phone, ask your pediatrician if they recommend someone nearby. But if not, then you know what? The Child Mind Institute is seeing kids online. They see them on screens. We have a sliding scale. We steal from the rich to pay for the poor um, because our fees are very expensive if you have a lot of money. And if you don't have a lot of money, we slide them down. But the idea is that there is help out there. And I think the worst thing we do is we wait. On average, parents wait two to eight years from the onset of symptoms before they get help because they, they want it to pass. They don't want to believe that their kids have one of these very real and debilitating illnesses, but they're treatable. I think it's because of the guilt that we were talking about before. Yes. Is it my fault? What did I do wrong? Um, I'm going to love them through this. I'm going to. And, and, and unfortunately, them. just caring a lot isn't enough. 
So, yeah. you know, it's DNA roulette. And, you know, I said before, you know, I have one kid who is definitely more uh, ill at ease socially and, and one kid who clearly had reading problems and, and one child who was a little bouncy. Do you mean, it? I remember when he took the ERBs, um, we went into the nursery school and to look at them and I said, these are very low. This can't, <laughs> my children don't do well. And they said, well, read carefully. And at the end it said, Sam was not in the mood to take the test. So he left. I said, what do you mean he wasn't in the mood to take the test? Did someone not beat him? I mean, what happened here? He said, oh, well, he wasn't in the mood. So, you know, every time you make a kid, you know, sometimes they have a musical ear, sometimes they have a predisposition to depression, sometimes a math disability. But, you know, it's our job as parents to scaffold, right? To offer right. support, to offer structure, to offer encouragement. But that might mean a special school, that might mean a mental health professional, that might mean a music teacher. This has been a really amazing conversation with you. And of course, the time just flies by. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Koplowitz, please put them in the Q&A box down at the bottom uh, next to Ray's hand. Um, this is unlike the usual Zoom meeting where you can just uh, you know put something in the chat box. Instead, there's a, a, a little Q&A icon at the bottom. You can click on it and enter your question. Um, but if no one does that in the next few minutes, uh, I just want to, again, thank our guest, Dr. Harold Koplowitz, his latest book, The Scaffold Effect, um, Raising Resilient, Self-Reliant, and Secure Kids in an Age of Anxiety, really is great. Of course, I haven't had a chance to read it all because, you know, life. But I have had a chance to browse through and have had such a wonderful time having several conversations with you. I'm sure the conversations will continue. And uh, anybody who doesn't have a chance to, to get the book or to to talk to Dr. Koplowitz the way that I have, can go to childmind.org and get further information about whatever age your kids are, about how uh, suggestions on how to parent better. Um, and actually, you even have some suggestions on how to child better. Like uh, you, you have something in the book, I think about uh, parentification, which is a great word, in action. And some of us are, we're, you never stop being a child. Right. Um, and you never but I think you parent. just think about go back to you know yeah. self-care is child care that this is COVID and it's not over it's a time it's really time to take care of ourselves to, yeah. to to unplug and to take care of ourselves and and if that means 20 minutes of meditation a day if that means just taking a walk or a run if that the glory of the gloriousness of the Hamptons to go to the beach and just sit on the beach yeah. to take care of ourselves because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't really be good parents. And, and the fact of the matter is being a great parent or, or being a, just a good parent is wonderful. I mean, nothing could be more rewarding, I think, than being able to enjoy seeing your kids grow up. And, and if we scaffold properly, well, then eventually the kids don't need us to scaffold. They scaffold for themselves. Just think when your kid goes off to college and is struggling with a writing assignment to be able to go to, you know, to the writing um, workshop, the writer's workshop to get some help, or if they really aren't feeling well, to be able to go to the mental health center, that, that would be success, that your child is able to take care of themselves, or that they're making sure that they do sleep enough, or right. that they are exercising enough. That's, that's what you really want. You want to be able to get to the point where you feel comfortable knowing that your kid can take care of themselves. Yes, that's wonderful. And what a great goal for us all to have and to learn to take care of ourselves so that we can they can emulate us. So uh, Harold, it's just been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I can't thank you enough. And I thank you, Bridget. Thank, I really want to thank the East Hampton Library again for their you know magnificent Authors Night, uh, which has been Authors Weekend and uh, giving us uh, always the opportunity to talk with fascinating authors about different subjects. Um, you know, what a difference by Friday, I interviewed Taylor Barton, who's G.E. Smith's wife and, and a fantastic singer songwriter about her book, I Pitched a Tent in Hell. Um, it's actually the like, almost the polar opposite of this because she talks about her childhood a lot. Um, and to have a chance to talk with uh, fabulous Dr. Harold Koplowitz has is, is really been an um, uh, incredible honor for me. So I want to thank East Hampton Library. I want to thank all of the sponsors um, of AuthorsNight.org. You can find more information at either East Hampton Library or AuthorsNight.org. And if you want to find out more about Dr. Koplowitz, it's on ChildMind.org. Please support your local library. Buy books, whether it's Kindle or uh, the hard copy. 
And uh, thank you. Is there anything else you want to add before we? Uh... No, Bridget, thank you for your enthusiasm, your honesty, and your intellectual curiosity. It's wonderful. It really has well, been a pleasure. You'll be hearing from me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you so much, Harold, for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. It was an amazing discussion. Um, and on behalf of the library, just thank you so much for the attendees and everyone that came tonight. Um, it was really fantastic. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank, thank you. you.